I am National Master Matt Jensen, and I have a new course out called Beating Beginners Move by Move, where we walk through 30 beginner games as if we're playing one of the sides and talk through all the strategies on how to outplay beginners. There's a link in the description if you want more info. The video you're about to see is one of the games from that course. Hope you guys enjoy it. And there's a coupon code in the description as well. Thanks for watching. We're on to game number three, and again, we have the black pieces. We see e4. C6, D4, D5, and this is another Karo Khan defense. My favorite defense for beginner players and club level players for the black side against one E4. So now in this game, we're looking at E takes D5. This is called the exchange variation. So the opening name is Karo Khan defense exchange variation. White decides to trade off the set of pawns early on. And here it's crucial that we capture back with the pawn. Let me show you why. If you capture back with the queen, that brings the queen out very early in the game and she can be attacked by the opponent's pieces. So try to keep the queen back early, take back with the pawn, and this pawn does a nice job keeping control of some of these important central squares. Knight f3 by white, developing their kingside knight as the first minor piece out, which will help white to get castled. Bishop to g4. This isn't my favorite move in the position, but it's not terrible. What we're doing here is we're pinning the knight on f3 to the queen on d1. And a pin is when a lesser value piece cannot move because there's a higher value piece behind it that's about to be captured. So if this knight moves somewhere, this queen gets captured. The reason it's not my favorite move is I think right now that bishop just feels a little bit loose out there. And in the Carol Concourse, I recommend bringing the knight out first. And I go into more detail on that course, but it's not real important for this course. Bishop to e2, breaking the pin. So now that knight can move, and the bishop is behind it, not the most valuable piece, the queen. Um, white's also getting ready to castle. So we play e6, preparing to develop our dark square bishop next. That pawn was in the way on e7. And his most natural square is going to be d6. From there, he points at white's king side. Castle by white. Both sides are playing pretty well up until this point. White's castled on move six, which is good. White usually does castle faster than black, um, so we need to get castled as soon as we can. Bishop to d6. Knight f6 is also a good move here, just developing the king side pieces, getting ready to castle. h3 by white. And here, what white's doing is they're putting a question to this bishop. Does the bishop want to retreat, or does he want to trade for the knight on f3? Usually in chess, the bishop is just slightly more valuable than the knight. So even though they're both worth three points, on average, you don't really want to just trade a bishop for a knight unless there's something else in the position that makes you think, okay, this is a good reason to trade bishop for knight. In this case, it's okay to take the knight, but it is better to drop the bishop back. So bishop goes back. And if white plays pawn to g4 here, you'll see a lot of players do this. They'll kick the bishop with h3, and then they'll kick it again with g4 when you retreat. That can be a dangerous decision because that would open up this white king. This pawn moving forward would create a lot of air in front of the white king, and that makes that king easier to attack. So white does not play g4. Instead, they play knight to c3, developing their other knight. We go knight f6. Both sides doing a great job getting their pieces developed. Bishop to g5. Now white creates a pin on our f6 knight. And one thing you have to think about with pins is can another piece or a pawn attack the pinned piece? The knight on f6 currently is attacked by this bishop, but no other piece or pawn can attack it. This knight cannot go here or here to attack. There's no pawns ready to attack. So we're safe to ignore that pin for now, and we castle. Move nine, got castled, that's pretty good. Knight to e5 by white. So what white's doing here is they're offering a trade of bishops. So we can either trade or retreat, but we cannot leave the bishop here because there's both queen and bishop for white attacking it. And this knight is actually pinned. So we gotta make a decision in the game. Black captures, which is fine. Queen takes back, that's a good move. And now we play bishop to e7, breaking this pin with the bishop. So both sides kind of showed that idea of how to break a pin with the bishop. 
And that's a common idea. And it's usually a good practical decision if you want to avoid tactical problems later on with the pin. Now white plays queen to b5. And here there is a big threat. So whenever your opponent makes a move, always sort of watch, is there an immediate threat? And then before you make a move, check, is there a really strong reply in return? Well, there is a big threat here. Queen takes b7 not only wins the pawn, it attacks the rook, and we do not want to allow that. So queen c7, defending this pawn, and we will get this knight out very soon. Bishop to f4 by white. White is applying the pressure there, playing with the initiative. We talked about the initiative quite a bit in game one. So far, we are reacting to white's threats in the last few moves. So early on, white's got the initiative. And there's this idea of the knight moving to g6, opening the discovered attack. So one piece moves, the other piece attacks. The discovered attack on our queen. And the knight guards the bishop and hits the rook at the same time. So this is a big threat, and that would win some material for white. So we play bishop d6. So instead of breaking the pin, we're sort of breaking the discovered attack, I guess you could say. Um, now if that knight moves, and we're going to take this bishop. Bishop takes bishop. Queen to b3 by white. And here, white misses a strong move that we could play in the position. This knight is now pinned by our bishop. Because we have queen and bishop lined up, the knight cannot simply go back to defend this guy because we have two attackers on it. So that would lose a piece for white. So we have a strong move here. We missed it in the game too. But knight to c6 puts a third attacker on this knight and attacks this undefended pawn. So it's a loose pawn. There's no pieces defending it on d4. For example, if white plays knight to b5 trying to guard the pawn, we can still take it. Using a tactic, we hit their queen, they're hitting ours, and after takes, takes, takes a rook, takes a rook, takes the knight, takes the knight, the dust settles, and we are plus one. You can see that here on the bottom of the screen. Gained one pawn of material. So, we missed that though. Played a6 in the game. I think the idea of a6 was trying to prevent knight b5. Pawn guards that square. Knight b5 would have attacked our queen and bishop. Knight a4 played, and I think white's looking to sink that knight into b6, attacking the rook. So now we finally develop the last minor piece, and instead of c6, we choose d7. Now why do you think we want the knight on d7? Well, we just talked about knight b6 being a threat. That's a big reason. The knight also guards c5, so this knight is guarding the squares that this knight wants to go to. Makes a lot of sense. White takes the knight. And here, this e5 knight was pinned, so it's kind of a logical decision. White wants to trade that knight, get rid of the pin. And when you're the side that's under pressure, a lot of times you want to create trades, break the pins, etc. Try to relieve that pressure and reduce the chances that you make a mistake. So that's part of White's plan here, too. We take back. Here you did not want to take with the queen, though, because that walks into knight to b6, forking queen and rook. So we take back with the knight. And here, white plays another good move. Bishop takes d6. They trade off another set of pieces. And at this point, we're in pretty much a dead equal position. So that's good for white because we had sort of turned the tables for a couple moves, pinning their e5 knight. So now we're getting close to an endgame. And it's white to move. They play rook a to b1. So question for you guys. We're on game number three. And I'm going to start to quiz you a little bit. How should we play this position? So if you want to pause the video, think about what you would do here as black. Okay, one good idea is to expand the pawns on the queen side. And the reason for this is because we have two queen side pawns, white has three. And we're going to start to introduce the idea here of a minority attack. It's when you have less pawns against more pawns. You use the side with less pawns push those pawns up the board and attack the extra pawns. And the whole idea is you want to create a weakness in your opponent's pawn structure in the end, right? So picture these two pawns trading for these two pawns. What happens in the end, this pawn is going to become a weak pawn. It doesn't have its buddy on b2 to defend it. So that would be a great plan. We also have what's called a half open file on the c file. Half open means there's one pawn on the file. So pawn to b5. Great move. 
hitting the knight, it's got to retreat back to c3. Now knight to b6. Notice how this knight can land on c4. This is called a knight outpost. An outpost square is a square that's defended by pawns typically, and a really strong outpost square is a square that cannot be attacked by any other pawns. This one could eventually be attacked by white's b pawn, but that's an awesome square for the knight. A nice outpost. Knight to d1 played by white. I think the idea here is they want to be able to slide the queen across the board and maybe play c3 to create a pawn chain. Knight c4. Great move. Threatening knight to d2, which is a fork of both rooks and the queen all at the same time. So an outpost square for a knight is a great way to launch an attack. We can already see here this immediate threat of the massive fork. White plays queen to d3, defending the knight to d2 threat, and they're probably looking to play b3 to get our knight off the outpost. So we play rook a to c8, getting the rook on the half open file. White goes b3, saying, all right, I want to kick your knight off that outpost square, but this move is a small mistake. Every time a pawn moves forward, it creates some additional squares that we can use that are holes in the opponent's position. So that pawn on b2 was guarding a3 and c3. When it moves forward, it guards a4 and c4. Well, that means these dark squares are now open for us to use. So here we play knight to a3. We took advantage of this move, and our knight attacks the rook and creates a second attacker on the c2 pawn. It's only defended once. So we have the initiative here. White is reacting to our threats. They play rook to c1. Now, we play rook to c6. So remember in the last game, we talked about doubling rooks on the open file. Here, we're going to double rooks on the half open file. We're going to play rook f to c8, triple attack the pawn on c2, both rooks and knight all attack this pawn. So what we're doing is we're finding white's weakest point on the board, and we're really just hammering on that weak point and using that to increase our advantage. Knight to e3 by white, defending this pawn with the knight. We go rook f to c8 to double the rooks. And when you're the side that has the initiative, when you're the side that plays actively, it's more likely your opponent makes a mistake. We're giving white tough questions to think about, move after move. Here, they play queen to d2. There was actually a better move. They should have played rook f to e1 and tried to put the rook on e2 to help defend this pawn. But they play queen to d2. Now we play queen c7. One, two, three, four attackers all hitting the c2 pawn. And white has one, two, three defenders. So white is one defender short. So what they decide to do is play actively. They play pawn to f4. They know they're going to lose this pawn in c2. And they, sit, they think, let's launch a kingside attack. It's probably not a bad idea in terms of, you know, we're human against human here. We're not trying to play perfect chess. But a good practical decision is, can they attack? on the king's side. So we grab our free pawn, knight takes c2, and this opens up these three pieces. This is now an open file. No pawns on the file. And white decides to simplify everything. Knight takes c2, we take back, they take, we take, they take, we take. So when the dust settles, we have a rook and pawn endgame. You can see down here, plus one in material, and our extra pawn is sitting right here on e6. Also, very important, our rook is on the open file. We control the open C file. White's rook cannot contest us on the file. Also, this rook is sitting on the second rank. We haven't talked about this yet, but rook's on the opponent's seventh rank. So in this case, it's the second rank on the board. For white, it would be the seventh rank. When you can get your rook on the opponent's side, on the seventh or second rank, it's a very strong square. It cuts off the opponent's king and also tends to attack pawns either from the side or from behind, like you'll see here. So white plays rook f2, and this is a small mistake. Um, as you get more experience playing endgames, you'll start to learn which endgame should be a draw and which endgame should be a win or a loss. In this position, king and pawn endgame up a pawn should lead to a win and it reduces the chances for white to create counterplay. So there's not a real great square to put that rook anyways, 
So we just decide, let's trade rooks, and we're going to show how to win the king and pawn endgame up a pawn. King takes f2, king f8. Now when you reach a king and pawn endgame, what you would love to do is get your king active. So we know our extra pawn is sitting here on e6. It would be great to get our king up to d6. Go f6, e5, use our extra pawn. White could trade off these two pawns on f4 and d4 for these two pawns. But then we're left with this guy, which is going to be a passed pawn. And that's how we're going to win the game. Create a passed pawn. King e3, king e7, king d3. We're both centralizing our kings. And this is a cool move by black. Pawn to b4. Um, the reason this is a cool move is because we already have this d-pawn controlling these squares. So let me highlight the squares. d-pawn controls these squares. b-pawn controls this square. White already has pawns on these squares. Notice what's happening here. How does this white king break through? Everything is being shut down currently. So b4 shut down this important c3 square where the king might have been trying to slide out and attack our, our queenside pawns. g4 by white. King d6. Here comes the plan. f6, e5, make a passed pawn. King c2. f6, getting ready. f5 played by white. And really there aren't any good options here. They're trying to entice us, I think, to take. They take back and it just delays us creating a passed pawn. But when you see a pawn push like that, you can always look to push past. Our three pawns are going to block white's three. There's no risk over here. And this guy is going to become a passed pawn, or this guy is going to become a passed pawn. So white goes king d3. We take. King takes. Now we have the passed pawn. If you have the, the endgame book, Silman's Endgame Course, he calls this technique the fox in the chicken coop. Essentially, what happens is. Our king and pawn are going to march up the board, and we can slowly push white's king back. Usually they zigzag backwards, and we move the king up and move the pawn together up the board. Eventually, we throw this pawn away. We let the white king take this pawn, and we use our king, which will be somewhere up here, to run for the other pawns. And that's why he calls it the fox in the chicken coop. It's like a fox loose in the chicken coop. Your king just runs over, grabs all the opponent's pawns, and their king can't do anything about it. So that's the strategy. So we first play king c6. This king eventually has to move backwards. This square is guarded by our pawn. These are guarded. This is guarded. King guards this. So this king eventually has to go to one of these two squares. That's when we move our king up and start pushing that past pawn. h4, h6. Um, this is stopping g5, but it was also fine to just wait with our king. Now white finally retreats, we move up. King d3, and we make another waiting move here. We just play a5, waiting for that white king to move. It's also fine to move our king here, but this makes a lot of sense to me. h5, and white wants us to play d4, and there's a bit of a trap here. If d4, king e4, we don't have any moves that aren't sacrificing a pawn. But with careful calculation, you can realize that it's okay to sacrifice this pawn. And that's what happens in the game. If you want to pause the video, try to figure out why. But I'll show you in the game now. d4, king e4. And it looks like we're stuck. This gets captured. This pawn gets captured. This gets captured. And if our king moves, any safe move for the king, any legal move, loses this pawn. So the best move is to sacrifice that extra pawn knowing that we can win the king and pawn endgame. White captures, and now we have what's called opposition. So this is more advanced than most 1,000 level games, but the player playing black here is rated about 1,000. And he's punishing an opponent rated 500 for going into this losing king and pawn endgame. But what's happening here is we have what's called opposition. And this is in Silman's endgame course. Opposition is when the kings are one square apart, and the opponent has to move. That's the most basic form of opposition. That's all we'll get into for now. So this king has to sort of pick a direction, and then we can either follow it, keeping opposition, or we can go the other direction. So it's a lot more powerful to be the side that has opposition in the endgame. And this only involves kings, by the way. 
That position is only between kings. King e3, we go king e5. So we keep opposition. White has to choose which, which way they go again. King d3, and now you can count this out. End games are very exact. King goes here. We're going to grab this pawn, and then these pawns are going to fall. We have to count. One, one, two, two, three, three, and so on. And figure out how long does it take for white to make a queen? How long does it take for us to make a queen? If you want to pause the video and try to do it, go ahead. So here we play king to f4, king c4, we take, king b5, we take, king takes, king g4, they take. So now the pawns are ready to race. Again, if you didn't pause it before, maybe pause it here and try to figure out what happens. How do we win this position? We play pawn to h5, a4, h4, king b5. White realized here that pushing this pawn is going to be one move too slow because we're going to move to h1 when their pawn's on a7 and our queen, our newly created queen, will guard their queening square. And that's an easy win. So they're trying to bring their king down to help now. They're bringing the king. Now they bring the pawn. But here we have an easy way, a simple way to stop that pawn. Queen a8, or a7. We grab this other pawn. White is toast now. They try to bring a pawn to help. It's not going to do much because our king comes over to finish the job. After b6, queen c6, there's no good moves for white. It's checkmate in one no matter what. King a5 leads to queen b5 mate, which is what they play, uh, making a queen. We have queen takes queen, which is also a checkmate. So here, checkmate. Black wins the game. So a lot of good learning points from this one. Um, we had the half open file, which was a big deal. But then we also had that just simplification. How do you go from a rook and pawn endgame to a king and pawn endgame up a pawn? Right? So after we won the pawn with the half open file and the minority attack, we simplified in the endgame up only one pawn. And you're going to find this can happen a lot in your games where you're up one pawn and you're able to simplify to a winning position. And when you're down that pawn, you got to fight for ways to avoid the losing king and pawn endgame like we saw here. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed this game, and we will see you in game number four.